Okay, so Second Peter and uh, chapter one, talking about elements of life and godliness. And again, this is taken from the phrase in verse three, where it says, "According as His divine power hath given unto us all things uh, that pertain unto life and godliness." And uh, so we've been talking about this now. This is, I think, our eighth week. <coughs> And the first few weeks, we spend some time just talking about why it's important that we add to our faith these things. That these things are found uh, in verse 5 and down through verse 7. And uh, we talk about why we ought to add these, these things to our faith. Verse 8 tells us that if we have these things in us, uh, that will be fruitful, uh, that will not be barren, and will, be, and will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 9 tells us if we don't have these things in us, uh, then we will be blind uh, in the sense of uh, short-sighted. Won't be, won't be able to see afar off, as it says. And, uh, and we'll forget that we were purged from our old sins. And, of course, all that goes along with that. And in verse 10, it tells us that by having these things in us, rather than being blind and forgetful, uh, we would actually be able to make our calling and election sure. This is not talking about making, uh, uh, this is not talking about keeping our salvation, but rather that which God gave us, we make it solid and sound. And, uh, and uh, if we do these things, these things found in those two verses or three verses, if we do these things, the Bible says we'll never fall. And by that meaning that we'll have the ability to uh, live in this world without uh, stumbling into sin and, and messing things up. And then in verse 11, we learn that even, even in addition to all that, that when we enter into heaven, uh, it says in verse 11, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we talked a little bit about the rewards uh, that we'll get in heaven and so forth. And some of us will have more rewards than others of us. And, uh, and don't assume, don't assume, for instance, I'll use myself as an example because I have the privilege of standing behind this pulpit all the time. Don't assume that because I'm preaching that I'm going to get more rewards than someone who's never stood behind a pulpit because that doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's based on what God has called us to do and whether or not we're faithful to what God has called us to do. And I don't have a better standing before God than anyone else just because I'm standing behind a pulpit. Uh, this is what God has called me to do. And God might not have called you to do that. Uh, the question is, are you faithful doing what God wants you to do? And the other question you have to ask yourself is, uh, the, when it talks about rewards in heaven and so forth, one of the phrases that's used is what sort it is. Talking about our works, what sort it is. And I can tell you there's a whole lot of people People that you know are in the forefront and it looks like they're living the high and holy life or whatever term you want to use but it's all vain it's all pride it's all just a, a showboat and so forth and uh, and God knows the sort of work it is and we might be able to fool each other but we're not going to fool God and and I heard it said and you've heard it said regarding going to heaven in general is there's gonna be a whole lot of people in heaven that you're gonna be surprised to see there and there's gonna be a whole lot of people not in heaven that you thought would be there and uh, and we have a way of fooling each other, but we can't fool God. And the same comes to our rewards that we have for us in heaven. And the point is, you should be doing what God wants you to do. And of course, there are certain things in the Bible that are obvious uh, for all of us to do. And then there's things that uh, is certainly individual. Anyway, so we learn why we should add to our faith virtue and to our virtue knowledge and so forth. And we talked about the fact that we all have this like precious faith that's found in verse 1. And uh, this like precious faith was given to us, or we obtained it. And it was through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, I didn't do anything to earn it. Uh, Jesus did all the work. He was the one that was righteous, and I received it, I obtained it through him. And, uh, and so did you. We all have a common salvation, as the Bible tells us. And, uh, and then he says that grace and peace... That we ought, that we have through Christ. I have grace in Christ. I have peace with God, and I can have the peace of God. But in verse two, he says that these things can be multiplied to you. So that's something that you might have more than I do, or I might have more than you do, because it can be multiplied to us. And so we have a like precious faith, but grace and peace can be multiplied to us, and we find that that's through again the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And then we learn that God 
has purpose. According to his divine purpose, he's given us these things that pertain to life and godliness. And so we have it. The illustration we used the last couple of weeks, if you were to be in the kitchen and, and you're you know whipping up some nice meal or whatever or baking a cake or whatever it is might do, and, uh, and let's say somebody purchased <clears throat> all the ingredients for you and the ingredients are right there on the counter and they're ready to be used. But it's up to you whether or not you're going to add to that mixture those ingredients. So we all have our light, precious faith, and God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now it's up to you and I as to whether or not we're going to add to our faith virtue and add to our virtue knowledge and add to our knowledge temperance and so on and so forth. That is a decision you and I have to make, but here's the key. That knowledge, that virtue, all those things we talked about, they were given to us by God. We have them at our disposal. There's no one here that has more ingredients than another. We've all been given the same amount of ingredients. It's up to us whether or not we're going to put them in the mixture. Now, with that being said, God has an order in which you're supposed to put them in. What happens if you put them in in a different order? I really don't know. Uh, I just know that God had them set out in a certain order, and I think they make sense as we get through this series and we study them out. We'll see why he has them in that order. But the same is true in that analogy of making something in the kitchen. There are certain items that you bake or cook that you can't add something in until you've already added something previously. Am I making sense? Uh, for instance, you're supposed to mix all your dry goods and all your wet goods or whatever the term is. Obviously, I'm not a chef, and obviously, I'm not speaking in the proper terms here. Uh, but you're supposed to mix them in at the proper time and whatnot. And uh, anyway, so that's what we've talked about so far. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we looked at in verse 5, it says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So we talked about virtue. And that virtue is basically, if we boil it all down, it comes right down to it. It's talking about moral excellence. And, uh, and we find that this is done through the Spirit, as we saw in Romans chapter 8. And uh, by having that, 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 that solid stand for moral excellence and not being swayed aside and being able to stand in God. Okay. Okay. And then we add to that virtue knowledge, which we started looking at last week. And this knowledge is dealing with an intimate understanding or intimate knowledge of God. And uh, we saw several times in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one, several times where it mentioned that these items that we have are through the knowledge of God. And we'll get to that at the end of today's lesson. Uh, but we talk about several things that we need to know. Okay, that we add to our virtue. If you want to stand firm, if you want to stand strong, you add to your faith. Uh, this like precious faith, you add to your faith virtue, but then you need to add to your virtue knowledge. Here's an example I suppose I could give you, those of you that are familiar with woodworking and so forth. Uh, you might be working on a particular, for instance, we did our floors in our house, the, the part that is done. There's still quite a bit to do. <sighs> Uh, but we put the floors down and so forth. And, and then my wife went through and after after Emma uh, and some of the others also that went through and sanded uh, with a small handheld orbital sander. Praise God, that wasn't me doing it. I just had the privilege of nailing the floors down and, and uh, whatnot. And, you know, and giving my wife, my wife measurements. She was out cutting the wood, bringing it in. I was nailing it down. And then when we were done, uh, some of the kids would go through on their knees and they would sand it. Well, you need to sand it before you do anything else, okay? Uh, you, do you no good to stain it if you didn't first sand it, right? And so she would, uh, they would sand it. And then after it was sanded and vacuumed and cleaned up and there's no debris, my wife went through and she uh, put this uh, something or another on it to give it the, the tint that she wanted. And then she would stain it. But you know what we did after it was stained? We didn't just leave it there. We added it to the stain a sort of polyurethane, if you will. What was that? A protective coating to make it to where the stain wouldn't just uh, come off or, or be scraped off and so forth. That, that protective coating that, that made it slick and made it uh, to where it's, uh, it's sealed and you don't have to worry about water and all that kind of thing. Well, that's the same idea here. We've been given faith, okay, and then we add to our faith virtue, and now we're adding to our virtue knowledge. And what's that going to do? Well, that's going to protect our virtue. Amen? And then we're going to add in all those other things, which will just be more layers of protection, if you will, so that we can have the promises that are found in verses 8 through 13. Is that all making sense? Good! I'm glad. All right. Tell you what. 
Uh, we're we're going to be having the hearse come out here pretty soon. Uh, but So we talked about some things that we ought to know. Okay, For instance, we ought to know His grace. But let me pray first. Father, we love You. Uh, and thank You for Your blessings. Thank You for being uh, letting us be here today. Thank You for meeting with us. I pray that You bless each and every one. Help us in the next service uh, to honor You in a great and mighty way. I ask in Jesus' name, Amen. So we learned that we need to know His grace. We looked in 1 John 5 for that, 2 Corinthians 8, and, uh, and we need to, to have an understanding that we have grace through God, and uh, obviously as 1 John 5 teaches us, that we may know that we have eternal life that is settled, that's solid, that's secure, and when I have that grace, that understanding of that grace, when there are moments where I slip and stumble, and, uh, and I have moments where I slip and stumble, and I'm sure you do too, but I can fall back on my knowledge that I have the grace of God upon me and I know no matter how much I slip and stumble, I know that I have eternal life and that in itself will help protect the virtue that I've added to my faith, that knowledge that I'm not lost, okay? And uh, in 2 Corinthians 8, we read, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that th though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And certainly, you understand, listen, listen, God's no fool. Am I right? And when he invests what he invested in my salvation, I guarantee you he's not going to allow that to be lost. You understand? He became poor that I could become rich. And uh, he became sin that I might have the righteousness of him uh, in me. And certainly this grace that he invested in me, he's not going to let it go to waste. And therefore, as we've been given the promise of the earnest of the Spirit and sealed under the day of redemption. And so I can rest that knowledge. We talked about knowing his will. Uh, in Romans, uh, uh, Paul speaking to the folks there that they will be filled with all knowledge and admonish one another. In Colossians, we learn that we need to uh, be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In the book of Psalms, we learn that uh, the psalmist, he cried out, Cause me, make me, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Yesterday we were at the, the men's meeting, the leadership conference there uh, down in Hanover, PA, and uh, one of the pastors that spoke, he pastors out in Philadelphia, and uh, he's got an interesting story. He didn't share all of it with us, but he has an interesting story. Uh, <clears throat> he was 31 years old when he got saved, and uh, he was a bartender at... Uh, Applebee's, I guess it was, and, and uh, he was a drug addict and all kinds of other stuff, and, and uh, two teenage boys came to his door one day and knocked on his door, and one of them was the pastor's son, as nervous as all get out, and was intimidated by him, and you know, hand him a track, you know, my dad's a preacher, come, come visit, and he said, I'll think about it, or I'll try, or something along that line, and uh, four weeks in a row, they knocked on his door, and he finally said, okay, I'll come. He had no interest whatsoever. He came, he sat in the back of the church auditorium, and the preacher is preaching on Psalm 23. There is no, uh, he, the way he worded it, the preacher did not dangle me over hell. He was just preaching on the goodness of God. And by the time I was over, I got up and I came forward. And you know, they asked for raising of hands. I raised my hand. I came forward. Pastor asked me, what, why did I come forward? And he says, I just want whatever it is you've got. Or I want whatever it is you're talking about. And uh, and through a period, he got saved, you know. And uh, and then uh, when he first got saved, he was still addicted to drugs and still doing all kinds of stuff. And, and he really had no knowledge that what he was doing was something he shouldn't do. But through the, the working of the Holy Spirit in his life, he got to the point where I just don't want this anymore. And he asked God to help him with it. And he asked God, please God, make me to not want this anymore because I know it's going to destroy me and eventually that's exactly what happened he said I know some people they got saved and boom they were free of it it wasn't like that for me I didn't get that but but when I did get free praise God I got free and he went off to Bible college and and uh, ended up marrying a, uh, a young lady and uh, there he is down in Arkansas I think is where he's from someplace like that and God sat him in the middle of Philadelphia uh, in the middle of the uh, gang territory of uh, most uh, most Puerto Rican and so forth. He's got he's got all walks of life coming to his church. Now, some of the story he didn't tell is some of those 
some of those, and I'm not. Don't take this any wrong way. Just understand that he's in the he's in what would be considered, you know, the hood, as it were. And uh, and we're talking gang territory, and he's living right there amongst them. But those, uh, some of those women, some of those Puerto Rican women that go to his church, I mean, they watch out for him. I mean, I, I'm telling you, they'll pull a gun out and shoot you if you say anything bad about about their pastor. And he's like, no, 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 you gotta stop. You know, it's okay, everything's fine. I mean, uh, but but the point is, anyway. He was preaching yesterday from Psalm 119. He was talking about the fact that many times the psalmist said, make me understand, make me understand. And this is why I said to you last week as well, that yes, we've got a free will. And yes, God has given us the ability to make choices for ourselves. But at the same time, we have the ability to go to God and say, God, I know that I'm making bad choices. And so I'm asking you to help me, make me, as he says in this Psalm 143, cause me to hear Cause me to know. And uh, so we need to know his will. We need to, I think, I think we also gave this. I don't know. This might be where we left off. So take your Bibles and turn to, turn to Psalm 9. And uh, Psalm 9, I spent again more time on review than I intended to, but those uh, truths I just shared with you tickle my soul and, and uh, didn't know they might tickle you again. And it's all good. But Psalm 9 and verse 10, he says, the psalmist says, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. You know what else we need to know besides knowing his grace and knowing his will? We need to know his help. We need to know his help. Add to your faith virtue. But then you need to add to your virtue knowledge. And there's a whole lot of things that God wants you to know. He wants you to know his grace. He wants you to know his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his will. But he wants you to know his help as well. Listen, the only way I'm going to be able to live this Christian life is if I've got the help of God upon me. The only way I'm going to be able to teach this book is if I have the help of God upon me. The only way I can raise my children is if I have the help of God upon me. The only way I can be a good husband is if I have the help of God upon me. The only way I'm going to make it in this dark world that we live in is if I have the help of God upon me. And here the psalmist says, they that know thy name. I don't know about you, but I know his name. Amen. I got saved. I'm different. I've been changed. I trusted him as a 10-year-old boy, and he placed his name upon me. I know his name. And he says, they that know his name, they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Where do you put your trust? You know, there's all kinds of stuff you can put your trust in. We talk about this. You can put your trust in all kinds of things. Your job, your, your relationships, your this, your that, the other thing. But those, those people that know the name of God, they put their trust in God. Amen. And he says, why? For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. You say, well, preacher, I feel like he's forsaken me. Well, then I have to ask you about your seeking. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, listen, listen, here's the thing. I love you, but uh, if I have to choose between believing you or believing God, I'm going to believe God. And God says that he's not forsaken those that seek him. And so if he hasn't forsaken those that seek him and you feel like you've been forsaken... I'm going to take God's side on this one, and I'm just going to assume you're not doing seeking. Oh, you know, I pray. Yeah, a little ditty here and there. Okay, listen. Uh, when we started having the teenagers over our house on uh, the second Sunday of the month, I think it is. No, the first Sunday of the month. Second Sunday. Second Sunday of the month. We had the teenagers over at our house. The first time we had them over, oh, my soul. Man, those girls are loud, George. I tell you what, you know. And uh, your daughter, no exception, okay? Uh, especially when she gets around the other, I don't have to tell you, that's right. And, uh, and so I still had some work to do and whatnot, so I went off into <laughs> my closet, literally speaking, and uh, sat with my laptop in the closet to do some work. There's a little table set up in there and whatnot, but I was sitting in my closet doing some work, and I, I thought the house was gonna fall down. But Ethan, he, uh, he retreated to his bedroom with headphones on and so forth, but they decided to play hide and seek. And, uh, and so I came out to see what was going on. Ah! So I decided to join in without them knowing. And so I hid behind the couch. And, uh, and then when they found out the pastor was playing too, they started searching all over the place. I'm grateful, I just want you to know right now, give a testimony, I'm so glad they didn't stop seeking. I think I'd have died behind that couch. <laughs> okay, you know. Uh, but the point is, they saw it and they saw it and they saw it and they saw it until they found. Jesus said, "If you seek, seek, and if you seek, you will find." Yeah. And so we need to know His help. The reason why people don't seek, though, is because they don't know the help of God. Right. 
All right, in Psalm 20, you can turn there if you'd like, verse 6, Psalm 20, and verse 6. The psalmist is making a statement. He says, Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. The psalmist had gone through some situations. He got through on the other side and he says, I know it for sure. Reminds me, I don't have it in my notes here, but it reminds me of Job. When Job made the phrase, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it, I'm going to paraphrase it, but he says, you know, I, I heard of you. You know, I heard of you, but now I see you. And with the seeing of my eye, now I know. Listen, you need to have a close walk with God, brother. Okay, you need to, you need to get to the point where you're seeing God. Right. Okay, add to your faith virtue, and then you need to add to that virtue knowledge. What's that going to do? That's going to seal that in. That's just another layer of protection. You need to know his help. In Psalm 46, <clears throat> as my voice cracks, in Psalm 46 and verse 10, beautiful verse, it starts off with two words I think many of us need to memorize, just those two words. Psalm 46 and verse 10. When you get there, read those first two words with me. Be, be still. still. Be still. You know, sometimes we just need to be still. Uh, I'm going to use my son. He doesn't know this as an illustration because last night uh, he was working there at OIP. And uh, he was telling me this on the way home. It was a it was a busy night, a hectic night, you know. And uh, they had some call offs. Some people didn't show up for work, that kind of thing. They had a, a banquet of forty uh, there, as well as the pack, you know, out to the you know to the street or whatever, you know. People just waiting outside to get in and find a seat. And uh, usually on a Saturday night, you need to have two dishwashers to keep up with things. You need to have two busters to keep up with things. Well, they were short all around, so he was working busser and dishwashing. And, uh, and a new guy, whose name is also Ethan, was working in the dishwasher room, and he's new, and uh, it, it was enough for a seasoned person to do it. It had been difficult, but for a new guy to do it, you know, even more so. And then they had another busser, and so he was kind of filling in on both sides. And so he would help bust tables for a while, then he'd go in, and then they'd get caught up on the dishwashing. As soon as they get caught up on the dishwashing, he'd go back out and start helping bust, and they get behind the dishwasher. And so he's running back and forth trying to do this, and uh, he's getting, from my, from my understanding, he's getting a little bit of a frazzled or frantic, frantic about it. And he's, got it, he's keeping his head. I'm not trying to paint him badly. But some of the people said to him, take a breath, man, you know, C calm down, everything's going to be okay. And, and so now in this situation, he had to keep moving, I get it. But sometimes, sometimes we get so frazzled with life that we're running around like a chicken with his head cut off. And what we need to do is just stop, be still, and know. He says, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Hey, folks, take a breath and know God's help. You're so busy trying to figure things out yourself, no wonder you keep making mistakes. No wonder things keep going wrong. No wonder things keep breaking. You know, I find this in my... You, you know this is true. You get frustrated with something. That's one of the best things you can do. You're working on something. You can't get it right. You're frustrated with it. Frustrated with it. What's one of the best... Outside of spiritual. Don't get spiritual with me right now. Right now. I can't speak. Uh, one of the best things to do is just walk away, right? Maybe take a walk, take a breather, you know, walk away from it. Now, better than that, obviously, is giving it to the Lord. But I'm just, from a very secular point of view, you know, you're trying to, you can't get this little item to work, whether you're, you know, working on some plumbing in your house, and uh, or you're working on, you know, whatever, and you just can't, you can't get it! You know, you're trying to figure this problem out. Sometimes you just need to step back from it, right? Step back from it, maybe look at it from a different angle, Walk away from it. Get your head on straight. Now here, if we then add a, a better idea to it, I, I shared with you how I was hooking up the electrical work for our our, uh, our oven. We moved it to another side of the kitchen, and it's right there next to the, you know where the wire comes down. It's right there next to the cinder block, and uh, and so forth in the basement. Very little room to work with. There's plumbing on there, and uh, I had a really long uh, electrical cord to, to work with. And I made the mistake of cutting it too short, you know. And I didn't have a I didn't have a, a wire stretcher, 
<laughs> and so uh, it, was, it was it connected, but it did it gave me less room to work with. You know, I had to put in a new junction box for it, and had very little room. I was standing on the ladder and standing on something else, balancing myself. You know, and uh, trying to get it, the electricity was off, so you know it's okay. And uh, but trying to get it all connected and whatnot, and 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 I my son was there trying to hold a flashlight, you know, his phone so I could see, and, and I'm getting frustrated. My hands are getting sore and tired. I couldn't get it. And finally, I'm like, I, I mean, I, I didn't cuss, okay? But if I was a cussing guy, I guarantee you I would have. You know, I, I mean, it was it was frustrating. And I, I finally said, Lord, would you just please help me? The next thing you know, it was all good. Like, Why didn't I do that sooner? You know, Why didn't I do that sooner? Why do we? You say that's a simple thing. Yeah, it is. But if we can't trust with those simple things, where are we going to take the big things to him? You know, we need to get in the habit of just trusting him from the very beginning. And how many times do we get ourselves in the middle of something, and then we say, God, we need your help. And like, oh, look at that. Why didn't we ask sooner? We need to know his help. Okay, I'm, i got to move on. Uh, not only do we need to know his help, we need to know his hope. Look at Psalm 39. Psalm 39. Verse 4, Psalmist says, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. You see, sometimes we're just too puffed up. This is Psalm 39, verse 4. I think I gave some, did I give you the wrong text? No? Okay. Sometimes we just, we're too full of ourselves. And therefore, we have our hope in the wrong place. Right. Okay? We have our hope in our strength. You know, I shared with you recently, my son and I, uh, he wanted to join the YMCA and, and whatnot. And, and so we went over there last Monday, I think it was, and uh, he got himself a membership, and, and he wanted to shoot hoops with me. And, you know, um, so I got a three-day pass so I could be there as well. And, we were shooting hoops together Monday afternoon, and uh, or something in the morning afternoon, something like that. And uh, end up some other people were there. We they end up playing. We end up playing a game three on three. I used to play basketball back in the day. Okay, <laughs> way back in the day. I told one of the kids as we were, you know picking out teams. I said, "Now listen, I'm old and I'm out of shape, so don't send me to the hospital." You know, they kind of laughed about it, whatnot. So as we played a while there, and I tell you, I was I was dead the rest of the day. I was oh, I mean, I was in so much pain. There's you know parts of me I didn't know I had anymore. You know, and they were hurting. You know, but no, I was like oh, okay, no, that's still there. <laughs> Wish it wasn't. And um, you know, and he wants to go back again, the jerk. And uh, and so I said, well, let's do it Wednesday. And then through Tuesday night, I said, can we, can you give me one more day? You know, I don't want to be like this Wednesday night. And so he's like, I guess. And so we went Thursday morning. Uh, left the house about seven o'clock. Spent about an hour and a half there. It took him uh, to do some practice driving for his parallel parking and so forth. And uh, but this time I stretched beforehand. I did some stretching and so forth, and that helped. But I'm still feeling it a little bit. And now I'm, I have a three-day pad, so I have one more day. And uh, so tomorrow, if if the Lord wills and time works on my schedule, we're going to go there tomorrow and shoot some hoops and whatnot. But why did I bring all that up? Oh, because it was a quick reminder to me of just how frail I am. You know? It's this quick reminder to me that I don't I don't have what I used to have, but I still have God. Amen. Now, you know, prayer for y'all get in shape. Just those two days I've lost, you know, five pounds, so that's something. You know. Uh, but Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. Help me to realize just how how much I, I need you. What it is that I may know how frail I am. Look at Second Timothy with me. Second Timothy chapter one. In Second Timothy chapter one and verse twelve, it says, "For which cause I do also suffer these things." And he's given testimony of you know, the persecution and such and whatnot. He says, "Nevertheless, I am not ashamed." Okay. Why? Uh, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This verse is 
wonderful, especially in the context of what we're talking about. We're supposed to add to our faith virtue, that holiness, that moral excellency and so forth. And then, as a kind of a sealant to help that, we add to it knowledge. We add to our virtue knowledge. And one of the things that we need to know is that he is the one that we believe in, and we're persuaded that he, see, this is key, he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You see, I came to God, and I said, okay, God, I'm going to make a commitment to you, and this is what I want to do for you. But God, I can't do it. <laughs> But I know whom I have believed in. I'm persuaded that you are able to keep the very thing that I committed under you against that day. Uh, living for God is not you uh, being more powerful than all the temptations around you. Living for God is you by faith trusting God and God being more powerful than all the temptations around you. You see, you need to know his hope. In 2 Corinthians 5.1, I'll just read it. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's talking about being dead, we know we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. Does, does knowing that you have eternal life do anything for you? No. Does knowing that if your body were to decay today that you have a better one waiting for you do anything for you? I know it does something for me, amen, especially after this last week and going to the lie twice. I know it really does something for me, amen. All right, let's move on. So we talked about things that we need to add. We need to add to our faith virtue, add to our virtue knowledge. We need to know his grace. We need to know his word. I don't think I reviewed that one with you, but that's fine. We need to know his will. We need to know his help, know his hope, know his power. Look at uh, Psalm 83. Psalm 83. I never, I've never said this as a kid, but you've heard the phrase, two, two kids are arguing, well, I, maybe not this per se, but other things, but anyways, you know, two, two boys are, are arguing in the playground or whatever, and you hear the phrase, you know, my dad can beat up your dad, right, okay, or, you know, or maybe it'd be some other kind of thing, is, you know, where my dad can do this better than your dad can do this, you know, that, that kind of concept, you know, where you have that little tit for tat going on. Well, may I say to you, my God can beat up the world's God. Amen? And uh, it says in Psalm 83, 18, that men may know that thou, God, that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. We need to know that. Listen, this world might be dark, Satan might be powerful, but compared to God, he's nothing. He's a nobody. Okay, He's stronger than you, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. And so I believe that in the power of God, you can defeat the devil any day of the week. But if you try to go up against the devil, mano a mano, you're in trouble. Okay, But when you go up against the devil in the name of Jesus Christ, you've got the upper hand. Why? Because it's not you, it's God. Okay, and the psalmist says, I want men to know everywhere that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, nobody else has that name, you're the only God, that thou art the most high over all the earth. I don't care what the politicians are doing, I don't care what the countries are doing, I don't care about the coronavirus that's out there right now, and so forth, whether it's man-made or whether it wasn't, whether there's a big conspiracy going on to try to call the population, or whether it's just something that's being used to try to cripple the economics of this world, or whatever the case may be, I don't care why it came, I don't care how it came, I don't care what it does, but I do know is that my God is the most powerful over all the earth. Amen. Whatever happens, happens. Uh, Psalm 100. You're not far from there, Psalm 100. Hey, we're going to finish this, it looks like. Psalm 100, verse 3. It says, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Can you just stop and know that the Lord is God? And He made you. You didn't make yourself. <laughs> Sorry, it just reminded me of a statement that one of our former presidents made. You didn't build that. Okay, whatever. But, uh, but the truth is, you didn't make yourself. Okay, He made you. Okay. He, he knows every hair in your head. 
He knows you're lying down and you're rising up. He knows if you're far off or if you're near. He knows where, well, you can't go anywhere. The psalmist says, not this psalm, but a different psalm, but you, I think. Uh, but you can't go anywhere uh, that he's not aware of your presence and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, we just need to know that the Lord, he is God, is he that made us, not ourselves. We're his people. And by the way, aren't you glad that you're his people? Now, I know the psalmist, he's talking to Israel. Okay. Israel, especially at this particular time frame, were his people. And uh, he's not cast them all forever. They will have a return. But right now, may I say to you, I'm his people. Okay. And uh, you're his people if you're saved. None of this matters to you if you're not saved. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, everything I've been saying is what's well, either falling on deaf ears or you're hearing something, but it doesn't apply to you. Okay. But you need to know his power. Then lastly, um, we need to know him. In fact, that's what Peter was telling us. Uh, so if you jump back to, well, no, let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Look at Philippians chapter 3. So if you're saved today, you know him to that extent, you know. You might have heard the phrase, do you know the Lord? And usually what people mean by that is, are you saved? Have you trust him as your Savior? And so you know him to that extent. But truth is, God wants you to know him beyond that. He wants a, a, a deeper relationship with you than whether or not you're saved. Being saved, that's just getting your foot in the door as far as a relationship with God is concerned. Okay, you're you're in the lobby, okay? You're not in the you're not in his office. Am I making sense? I mean you you have access to him, but whether or not you claim access, another thing. It's like uh, you you're in the courtyard of the king, but you could be in the court you could be right there in the throne room if you wish to be. Am I making sense with these silly analogies. And so in Philippians chapter 3, we have Paul, uh, he's in jail, Roman prison, and he's writing to the church of Philippi. And in verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the what? Knowledge, Knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He says all these things, he, he gave us his pedigree. You know, all these great things that he's done in his past as far as the Jewish faith is concerned and whatnot. He says, but I count it all but loss if I could just have the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may what? Win Christ. Okay? I, I count everything in my life, whether it be good or bad, all the accolades that I have, all the doctorates behind my name, if you will. I count it all but dung, okay, that I may win Christ. Verse 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Paul just had a desire to know God. I just want to know you, God. You know, I just want to, I want to get close to you. I want, to, I want to know. Is it okay for me to say this? And I'm not saying that's going to happen. Okay, but I want to know God better than anybody knows God. Is that okay? And by the way, you ought to want that too. You know, there's this famous song, uh, I guess it's famous, He loves me like I was his only child. Okay, never felt so loved before, I could never ask for more. He loves me like I was his only child. And the, the, the part of it, it talks about my father has a great big family and there are many children besides me. And some about how he divides his time, but I never have to stand in line. And uh, and basically, the song goes on. Although he's got all these children, the love that God has for me is as if I'm his only one. Okay, all this time and devotion and efforts are placed on me. Now he can do that because he's eternal and whatnot. And you know, if you've got multiple children, you've got to figure out how to divide your time between them. But each one of your children better should feel like they're one of the most important things in your life, right? You know, except Ethan. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, uh, but here, it, we see it on the opposite side. Uh, he's saying, I want to know God. And, and, and what I'm saying to you is, I, I want to know him. I want to have such an intimate, close relationship. No offense to any of you, but I want to know him better than anybody else. Okay. In other words, I want to know him better than I know you. I want to know him better than I know my wife. I want to know him better than I know anyone else in here. But I also want to know him better than you know him. Because I'm selfish that way. If, if only one person can be leaning on his breast, I want to push John out of the way so I can. Okay? 
Now, I'm grateful that it doesn't have to be that way. He's got time for all of us, and we can all know him as intimately as anybody else, and no one uh, can have that monopoly on him. But if there had to be a limit, we're fighting, okay? Although that right there probably causes me to be disqualified because, you know, don't fight, right? But the point is, we need to know him. After your faith, virtue, but to your virtue, you need to add knowledge. Okay, let me give you a few more verses and we're done. Ephesians 1. Uh, you can turn there if you like. We're going to be in Ephesians 1, verse 17. He says, I'm going to go ahead and read it, though, because of time. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of what? Him. Him. All right. Chapter 4, verse 13 of Ephesians says, um, Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Second Corinthians 10, 5 says this, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One reason why we don't know him like we should know him because we've got a whole lot of other stuff going on out there that we need to get rid of. Casting down the imaginations, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me know him. And again, in our text passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so, add to our faith virtue, and add to our virtue knowledge. And next week we'll start looking at, um, in verse 5, or verse 6, where we add to our knowledge temperance. All right, God bless you. See you in about 15 minutes.